Grab your Bibles, we'll get into the sermon now. Grab your Bibles and turn back to the book of Job. The book of Job. So uh, today I decided to take a, uh, to move away from the book of Luke just for this one Sunday, seeing that it is our final Sunday for the year. In fact, it's our final service for 2018. And I was, as, as I was thinking about the, you know, the change of year, it's often a time, right? When we, when we come into a new year, it's often a time when you reflect back and you look at the year that's gone by and you think about all the great things that were accomplished. But you also think about the things that could have been better. You could have done better. You could have done more of areas of maybe your life that, you know, you need to improve in. And that's why so many people, um, you know, create New Year's resolutions, and they say in this new year, you know, I'm going to lose weight. In this new year, I'm going to be healthier. In this new year, I'm going to read more Bible. In this new year, I'm going to go soul winning more than I did before or whatever it is. You know, people create these new year resolutions because it is a good time to reflect and think about, hey, we're coming into a new year, you know, and what is it that we want to achieve in 2019, all right? And I was thinking about our church, you know, I was talking a little bit about this on, on Wednesday, how, you know, our church is only a year old. You know, I'm only a one-year-old pastor. And I'm thinking about, hey, you know, you know, what can we do greater? What can we do better in 2019? Hey, what is it that we need to do? And if you look at Job chapter 2, verse 3, there's something that God says about Job. Okay? Now, if you remember Job chapter 1, what happens in Job chapter 1 is that the devil comes with the sons of God and God points out his, his, his servant Job as being a perfect and upright man. Yeah? And then uh, Satan challenges that. He says the only reason he's upright and good is because you've blessed him. You've blessed the work of his hands. And so God allows Satan to take away the possessions of Job. And Job loses his cattle. Job loses his wealth. You know, uh, for, from, you know, some, some enemies come and, and take the, his, his sheep and, and cattle. There's also fire from heaven that falls on. I can't remember right now, Job chapter 1, but on some other um, uh, livestock that he has. And worse than that, worse than losing all his possessions, is that his ten children die. His ten children lose their lives. His seven sons and his three daughters. It reminds me of me. You know, I've got seven sons and three daughters. If I were to lose them... Well, that would be crushing. That would be a big blow, right? All in one hit to lose your family as well, your children, you know? And so in chapter 2, we see Satan come to the Lord again, okay? And look what the Lord says about, uh, in verse number 3, look what the Lord says about Job. It says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man? Hey, wouldn't you love God to say that about you? Wouldn't you like God to say that about New Life Baptist Church? That it's a perfect and upright church? After losing all our possessions, after losing family members, God can still say that about us? I don't know about you, but I'd probably be questioning God a little bit, right? But look, one that feareth God and escheweth, escheweth evil. And this is what I want to talk about today. It says, and still... He holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. So the title of the sermon this morning is Hold Fast Your Integrity. Hold fast, hold firm, hold strong your integrity. Hey, we want to be a people in 2019 that's known for their integrity. A church that's known for the integrity that we are an upright, we stand with God, we fear God, and we eschew evil, right? That's what I want to see in 2019. He's saying, why are you choosing this topic? It's, well, basically, you know, if you've been in the construction business before, you know, I've worked for a construction company for two years, or two and a half years, roughly. And one thing you learn is that, you know, when a house is going up, when a building is being put together, once you have laid foundations or what once you get through different phases of that construction guess what it's always important that someone goes and checks the integrity of what's being built okay you lay the foundation the concrete slab for a house for example before you start putting the framework up you send the site supervisor out there to check the integrity of the foundation okay and usually there's a third party person an inspector that comes along 
and checks the integrity of the work that is being done. And until that work is being checked off, yes, it meets the, 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 the standards, it meets, it meets the codes and practices that we have, then the next phase of building is, is, is done. Okay? And what we're doing right here on the Sunshine Coast is building a church. Okay? And I would say for the first year and a bit, what we've been doing is laying the groundwork. Okay? Laying down the foundations so we have something strong and firm to build on. Okay? One thing I've learned in business is this saying, you know, um, under promise and over deliver. Who's heard that before? Under promise and over deliver. Hey, that's very important. Okay? Because what's the opposite to that? You over promise and you under deliver. Okay? You over promise. You know, I want to be a people with integrity. You know, if you're someone that promises something, but you don't do what you promise, then you're lacking integrity. Okay? You're lacking integrity. But if you're someone that under promises and you over deliver on that on what you promised, you'll be someone with great integrity. Not only did they accomplish what they said they will, but they've gone above and beyond that. Okay? And it's so important when you build that you check the integrity of what you're building. Okay, make sure there's nothing faulty. Make sure whatever holes there are, that they're plugged, okay, and fixed up. Now, if we look at just the definition of the word integrity, the first definition for the word integrity, to integrity is wholeness, something that's whole, entire, and unbroken. Okay, whole, entire, and unbroken. In fact, it's very much like the word perfect. The word perfect in the Bible, you know, when the Bible says, be ye perfect, <coughs> it's not saying be ye sinless, but be ye whole, okay? Be a well-rounded Christian, you know? And uh, if you look at Job chapter 2, verse 3, if you look at it again, where it says, uh, you know, hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is, a, there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man. It's very similar to the word perfect, Okay? But integrity is making sure that whatever is lacking is being fixed up, okay? That, that it's strong, that it's a whole thing. The second definition of the word integrity is more like the word, the way we, we commonly think about it, is moral soundness, purity, and genuine, okay? Hey, yet I want that for this church. I want people to see this church and say, hey, they are sound, they have morals, you know, it's, it's, they have purity in the church, right? They, don't, they, they, they preach against sin, and if there's a sinner that's worth, worthy to be cast out of the church, then they would cast out that sinner and maintain the purity that's in this church. Hey, that's what I want for this church. But we say it's, it's genuine. It's a genuine church. Hey, these are genuine believers. They believe the Bible, okay? And they preach it in season and out of season. Yes, I want people to look at New Life Baptist Church and say this is a church of integrity, okay? We, we've built some, you know, first year or so, we've built, we need to make sure that, uh, that we check the integrity of this church before we continue building and doing greater things for God, all right? Now, if you, uh, oh, actually, you don't need to turn there, I'll just read it to you quickly. You guys know it from Matthew 16, verse 18. Jesus says to Peter, upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hey, you know what a church is? It's something that is being built. Okay, it's a building as it were. And of course, we're talk not talking about this building. We're not talking about, you know, uh, what is it? Unit 9, you know, 16th Seidel Street. No, I'm talking about the building of the people. You guys are that church. You guys are being built up by Jesus Christ. And we also know in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, it says, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Hey, ye are God's building. How can we ensure that we maintain integrity in this church? It's by making sure you guys are built up by Jesus Christ. That you become fellow laborers with Jesus Christ in your own lives and in this church. Okay, yes, Jesus said he will build the church but we are co-laborers with him, okay? So in our second year as a church, I want us to check on the integrity of ourselves, the integrity 
of our church. How well are we doing? You know, are we doing great? Good. You know, is there anything that needs to be replaced? Yeah, let's fix it. Let's replace it. Let's do better. Okay. When, when you've built a house and you put up a framework, you know, you put up the, the wooden uh, beams, you know, the several beams, you know, that the carpenter would put up for the framework of the building. All right. Several beams. But what if one of those beams is termite ridden? Like, like back there, like where the, where the toilets are, okay? What if one of those beams are termite ridden? Or they're not in the right place? Do you think the inspector's going to come and say, well, you know, 99 of, of the beams are, are set up right, so we'll just ignore that one? No. To make sure that we maintain the integrity of that building, that beam would need to be replaced, okay? That beam would need to be replaced. So we need to make sure that we identify where we fail, if we have failures, I'm sure we do, okay, where we can improve and what we can change, okay? 2019 is to make sure that we have a church of integrity. Look at Job chapter 2 verse 7. Job chapter 2 verse 7. Now, we as a church, we've not really gone through any, any major tribulations. Maybe you're in your own personal life, you've gone through some tribulation. But I would say as a church, we really haven't gone through anything major. But look at this in verse number 7. So when Satan sent forth, sorry, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And, this, and he took him a pot shed to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. So we have now Satan, God allows Satan to hurt uh, Job in his body, okay? But God says, but look, you can't kill him, okay? You've got to save his life. I'll let you, you know, destroy his body, but you've got to save his life. You can't kill him. And so Satan puts these boils, these sores all over his body, and it said there in verse 8 that he got a piece of pot shed just to scrape himself. I mean, you know, you've had a, probably a mosquito bite and gets itchy, and scratching it gives you some, you know, some measure of satisfaction, right? Well, it's kind of like that for Job. He gets this piece of, of uh, I don't know, like maybe a piece of uh, clay or something and starts scraping at his sores. I mean, that's how bad he is, right? And then look at verse number, number 9. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Hey, those are the words of Job's wife. She says, look, you maintain your integrity, forget about it. Look, look at the state you're in. We've lost our children. We've lost our possessions. You've lost your health, Job. You know, just curse God and die. Okay? So what, what, what is Job's wife thinking here? She's thinking, look, God's obviously um, angry at you, Job. That's what she's thinking. You know, God's no longer on your side. God's no longer your friend. Just curse him. God wants to kill you. Just die. You know? But hey, look, what does she, when she looks at Job, what does she see? She sees his integrity. Okay? He doesn't curse God. Okay? He doesn't blame God for his tribulations and his anguish. Okay? He doesn't do that. Okay? And what does he say in verse number, uh, number 10? But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we, shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Hey, you know what? When you go through tribulation, you're going to be tempted to blame God. Okay? But what does Job say? Hey, we, we, ought to do, we, we, we get good from God. Hey, we have salvation. We have the best thing that we can possibly ask for, eternal life in heaven forever. And we can't take a bit of hurt in Job's position, a lot of hurt, a lot of loss, you know, and blame God. No, that's foolish. Okay, that's foolish speaking. You're like one of the foolish women, okay, he says to his wife. But notice that he does not sin against God with his lips, okay? And, um, you know, we need to be careful when we go through tribulation, okay? And, and just let me give you an example of this. You know, when you go through trials or hardships, you might start saying things like, you know, why does God allow this difficulty in my life? Why did God allow this? You know what you're really saying? 
what you're saying, when you're asking those kinds of questions, you're, what you're usually saying is, God shouldn't have allowed me to go through this. Hey, that's blaming God. Okay, that's blaming God. Hey, you know what? If there's something I wish we could change about this world and this generation, is that people would just be accountable when things don't go right. Okay? Instead of blaming God, instead of blaming other people, sometimes you just got to look at yourself and go, well, you know, this has happened because of me. Or you rejoice in the tribulations that come your way. God wants to use that to make you more perfect, to improve you, to change something about you. Okay? I mean, some of you wouldn't even be saved if you didn't go through the tribulation and then yelled out and called unto God for that salvation. Sometimes God has purposes for the tribulation in our life, okay? To lead us to salvation sometimes, yeah. Or to get us through and make us to be better Christians, Christians with integrity, okay? Job's wife did not have integrity at this point in her life. Now, keep your finger in Job. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. So as you're turning there, instead of, instead of asking, why does God allow this? Your question should be, what does God want me to learn through this difficulty? What does God want me to learn through this trial? Okay? Maybe he's chastising me. Maybe there's something I've done wrong and God has allowed some chastisement to come my way. But look at Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Okay, we rejoice in the glory of God. We rejoice in salvation, that we have peace with God. But verse number three, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Hey, if, if this church goes through tribulation... That's a time for us to glory in our tribulation. Why? Why is it that we really want to suffer and go through difficulties? No, because look at this. Knowing that tribulation work of patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Hey, look at this. Tribulation, it's not really what we like, right? But what does God use tribulation for? To give, us ex to give us patience, experience, hope, to be unashamed of godliness, to be unashamed of the Bible. Hey, these are marks of a man with integrity, a man who's patient, a man who's got good experience, right? Who's unashamed of God, who has hope. These are attributes of integrity. Okay, and how do we get it? Sometimes God needs to put us through tribulations in order to achieve that in our lives, okay? And if anything, Job was already a man of integrity. If anything, after this trial, he came out even better, okay? I, I'd be, you know, I, I can't wait to see the rewards that Job will have in heaven, you know, for, for facing the difficulties with integrity. All right, let's turn to uh, Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. Why do we want to walk in integrity? Why is it important? Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. Number one, walking with integrity will cause God to take extra measure to warn you before you destroy your life. Okay? If God sees you walking in integrity, He's going to take extra steps to protect you from destroying your life. Look at Genesis chapter 20 verse 3. And if you guys remember the story, Abraham was passing through and he was afraid that he would be killed because Sarah, his wife, was very beautiful. He was afraid that people would take his wife and kill, his, kill him to take his wife. And it almost happens. You know, King Abimelech comes and, and, and Abraham lies about his wife, you know, and he says, that, well, that's my sister because he didn't want to lose his life. And then so King Abimelech takes... Sarah to be his wife, but look at verse number three, Genesis chapter 20, verse three. It says, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. 
for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, would thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister, and she even her, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. He says, Lord, I've been tricked. I'm innocent. In my integrity I took her to be my wife. But look at verse number 6. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou hast done this in the integrity of thy heart. So the reason I know you, you, know, you have integrity, and then it says, Look, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. I said, look, King Abimelech, I've seen your integrity. This is why I'm coming to warn you, so you don't sin against me. You see that? You see, King Abimelech here, you know, could have done a major sin, committing adultery here with another man's wife, you know, but he was innocent. You know, he had integrity. He wouldn't have done it if he knew it. Is basically what he's saying. And God says, yeah, that's right. And that's why I'm warning you so you don't sin against me, so you don't become that dead man that you almost are. Look at number seven, look at verse number seven. And look, even when he was warned of God, he still had to make the right decision, okay? He still had to give back Sarah, uh, back to Abraham. But verse number seven. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. For if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. So you see, when you walk in integrity, God's going to protect you from making major um, mistakes in your life. Okay? He's going to step in and, and make it very clear that you don't make that bad mistake to destroy your life, but that you would walk, continue walking in the integrity of your life. That's the first mention of the word integrity in the Bible. I thought it was in, 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 interesting there that it's also related to being innocent. That that word like genuine, okay? He didn't mean anything uh, harmful toward Abraham or to Sarah. Now turn to Psalm 26, please. Psalm 26. Psalm 26. Psalm 26. Have you guys heard of the term backsliding before? Okay. Quite often when there are believers that once were faithful to church, that once were faithful to God, and then they get out of church for whatever reasons, you know, and they pursue a life of worldliness or, you know, self-pleasures and etc. Quite often these people are labeled as backsliders. Okay. And of course, when you're backsliding, you don't have integrity. Okay. And look at, look at Psalm 26, verse 1, a psalm of David. It says, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. Hey, you know what's going to keep you from backsliding? What's going to keep you in church? What's going to keep you faithfully serving the Lord? What's going to keep you faithfully out soul winning is integrity. Okay, being a person of integrity, but not just that, trusting also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. Hey, if you've gone for a period of back, you know, being backslidden, it means that you're lacking integrity. It means there's been a time that you've not been trusting the Lord. Okay? We need integrity to prevent us from backsliding. We want to check the integrity of this church. Hey, we don't want to be backsliders. We want to be sliding forwards. We want to be taking steps forward and being more Christ-like, okay? Being more holy, being more like the God, like uh, more in the will of God, okay? That means we need to be people of integrity, a church of integrity. Go to uh, verse number nine in the same Psalm, Psalm twenty-six, verse nine. You know, walking with integrity will separate you from the wicked. If you've got wicked friends around you, you know, wicked colleagues that are trying to peer pressure you to make wrong mistakes, you know, if you walk in integrity, it's going to separate you from the wicked. Psalm 26 verse 9. David says, Gather not my soul with sinners, 
nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be merciful unto me. Okay? Look, if you're walking with integrity in your life, you're not going to be numbered amongst the wicked in this world. You're going to stand out like Job stood out to God. You know, and he was able to look at Job and say, look, that's a man of integrity. And you're not going to be numbered with the wicked people. All right? Don't give in to peer pressure, especially young, you know, young guys, children, teenagers. You're going to be often tempted by, by, by friends that you make that are not believers. They're going to they want you to walk in paths of wickedness. Okay? But you need to be kids, teenagers, and even adults of integrity to stand for what we know is true and what is right in the Word of God. And look, it's going to cause you to lose friends when you stand for the Word of God. Okay? They're going to think you're a, you know, a goody-goody. They're going to think that, you know, what's wrong with this person? Why can't they have a bit of fun? And what they mean by fun is why can't this person sin, you know, and, and rejoice in, in, in wickedness, you know? Quite often, if you just stand in your integrity, you're not going to have to leave them. More often than not, they're going to just leave you, okay? Because, you know, they're going to see the goodness in you. They're going to see the genuine in you, genuine nature in you, the good morals in you, and that's going to make them feel bad about themselves, Okay, and they're not going to want to be part, you know, be friends with you. But that's okay. You know, we don't want to be counted amongst the wicked. Okay? Now go to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. Parents, parents, do you love your children? I hope so. Amen? If you love your children, look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. The Bible says, The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. You want the Lord's blessing on your children? You've got to walk in integrity. Okay? You've got to set a good example for your children. So your children know what it means to be just. Okay, what it means to be people of integrity. You know, children, are, uh, you know, because they've got like a, a clean mindset usually, you know, when they grow up, it's very easy for them to see hypocrisy. It's very easy to see someone that's uh, disingenuous. Dis disingenuous. Is that, did I pronounce that right? Someone that's not genuine. Okay? It's very easy for a child to see that. It's a little bit harder when you become an adult because, you know, you, you're sort of tainted with the world and, and uh, you know maybe maybe you know maybe you are hypocr hypocritical in some areas of your life, okay? But look, if you want your children to be blessed by God, you need to set an example of what it means to have integrity, okay? Very very important that walking in integrity will bless the next generation. And guys, yeah, we're a church that's one year old, but you know I'm already thinking about the next generation. I'm already wanting our children to be greater Christians than what we are. I want them to do greater uh, work than what we've done. Okay? And to continue New Life Baptist Church, to, be, to continue for this church to be a church of integrity. You know, quite often in many churches, you see a change of generation, and it gets worse. Okay? It doesn't get better, but the next generation takes the church down a notch. It becomes more worldly. Okay? And, you know, they desire for the church to grow and desire to follow after the flesh. And they take the church down a bad path. And it's just, it's no different to many churches like a nightclub in the world. Okay? No. I want every generation that goes past in this church for this church to stand out even more. To be more salty. To be a greater light in this world. Okay? How do we do that? We need to be a people, adults of integrity that the kids can see that and emulate that. You know, when I was a child, I was in a dead Baptist Union church, all right? And I'd go to church because my parents made me. But I wanted to be in church because I, I, I was saved and I, and I loved the Lord and I just I wanted to know more about the Lord. But I didn't have good examples. You know, I saw watered-down believers and I'm like, it doesn't look like the people that are reading the Bible. 
you know, these people that go to war, like, like King David against Goliath, I'm not seeing that in my church, you know? And then I'm growing up as a teenager, and my friends invite me to their Pentecostal churches, and I'm like, wow, maybe, you know, these Pentecostals, they look really excited. They, they look like they're on fire for God. So maybe I'll go there and catch a bit of fire and bring it back to my dead church. So I thought, you know, I go into those churches, no Bible, all right? I mean, just foolishness, you know, jabbering nonsense, which they call tongue speaking, you know, that gave me, you know, I mean, I was, I was like, man, Lord, where is the, where is, where are the good churches gone? You know, where do I need to go to, to find a bit of excitement? You know, I was looking for a church of integrity, a church that believed the Bible. That's what I was looking for as a young man. It took me until I was 20 years old, after I won my first soul, my wife, you know, to the Lord, right? We were looking for a good church. Why am I an independent fundamental Baptist? Is it because I grew up independent fundamental Baptist? No, it's not. It's because I was looking for a church with integrity, a church that believed the King James Bible, believed we had the perfect word of God somewhere and taught it, okay? And even if I didn't like what was being taught, if I knew it was coming from the Word of God, I believed it. That's what I was looking for. I was looking for people that actually believed in hell, that believed they could get out there and preach the gospel and save souls. That's what I wanted to see. That's what young people want to see. They want to see adults that actually believe this book. All right? Look, there's no perfect church. You know, I, I know that. But we can be a church of integrity. Okay, that's what we can be. And that's what I, you know, that's why I'm an independent fundamental Baptist. It's because I made the decision to find a church that was real, okay? That they said they were Bible believers and actually read the Bible as well. They knew what the Bible contained. We need to be a church of integrity. Did I get you to turn somewhere? No, but that's okay. You know, we need to have integrity to maintain the course. I mentioned that we're an independent fundamental Baptist. Hey, even when we had our name as the church in Caloundra, you know, made it very clear what we stood for, okay? And these three words, independent, fundamental, Baptist, are, are words of integrity for a church, okay? It's not just some brand. It's not just some movement. They actually mean something, okay? Independent. Why independent? Because we're ensuring that Jesus Christ is the head of this church. Not some man, some president, some pope. No, Jesus Christ is the head of this church. Okay? Hey, that's what's going to make us a church of integrity. To ensure that it remains Jesus Christ. That we don't become a church that's trying to fit, you know, some system or fit some denomination. No. Okay, we're here to serve the Lord. Are you, guys, you guys are still, oh, no, you guys went to Proverbs, but if you go to Psalms, not too far. Psalm chapter 7, verse 8. Psalm chapter 7, verse 8. Look at this, in Psalm chapter 7, verse 8. The Bible says, the Lord, the Lord shall judge the people. Hey, who's the judge of this church? A pope, a president. No, it's the Lord. The Lord is the judge of this church. Then it says, judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity that is in me. Yes, that's my desire for New Life Baptist Church, that God will come and judge this church and judge us in our righteousness and judge us by our integrity. Okay? If we're part of some denomination, it's not the Lord judging us, it's that denomination. It's that president, it's that man, no. Independent because the Lord Jesus Christ is the head of this church. Fundamental. Fundamental, important. Okay? We stand for the fundamentals of the Christian faith. Okay? Fundamental is the same as the foundations. You know, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Hey, we start, stand for the fundamentals of the faith. What's that? The virgin birth, the deity of Christ, the second coming of Christ, the blood atonement, and the salvation by grace through faith. Yes, and even the Trinity. 
You know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, these are fundamentals of the Christian faith. These are fundamentals of New Life Baptist Church. Okay? And if we're going to maintain our integrity, and I've already had to do this, you guys know, then we have to separate from those that do not hold those to those fundamentals. Okay? If we're going to protect the integrity of this church, we are a fundamental church. And we're Baptist. Because I don't want to confuse this church for some baby sprinkling Protestant church. Okay? We believe the Bible. We believe in baptism, which means immersion. Okay? We, and we believe in believers' baptism. Not as a requirement for salvation, but as something done after someone is saved, identifying publicly with the death, burial, and resurrection. Identifying publicly with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? Baptists because of practice, but Baptists also because of history. Hey, because there's been believers before us that have stood for the Word of God. There's been believers before us that have stood with integrity. And more often than not, it's been those that have come out of the Baptist churches in the past. Okay? So we're following up that in the history as well. All right? Can you go to Proverbs chapter 19? <coughs> Proverbs chapter 19, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 1. Integrity is better than riches. Okay? Integrity is better than riches. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 1. Better is the poor that walketh in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips, and is a fool. Hey, you know what? We can grow this church faster if we wanted to. Yep. You know, more people, more offering, more riches. It can be done. Yeah, there's plenty. I mean, just, just take me to Kurong. You know, I'm sure there's a whole aisle of how to grow your church and how to make it, you know, uh, more attractive and bring in the finances. Yeah, some people take that path. They do, you know. They do take that path because of riches, okay? But you do that and you lose the integrity of your church, all right? I'd rather be poor, okay? I, I, I'd, I'd rather, you know, I mean, one of the best decisions I've made in my life, honestly, is becoming a pastor, coming up here to the Sunshine Coast and preaching for you guys, you know, and trying to help you guys and edify you guys. It gives me so much joy in my spirit, you know? But it doesn't make me rich, you know, uh, I've, I've had to give up my riches very much so, you know. And I didn't really have riches to begin with, but, you know, I had plenty. God had given me a lot. You know, but one of the best decisions has been come and be a pastor and to serve in the local church. It's been one of the best decisions of my life, you know. I'd rather have the integrity of this church. And I know if we do that, Jesus Christ said he will build our church, okay. We just have to be faithful. We have to be people of integrity. And we need to just trust in the Lord, have faith in Him. All right. Now, can you go back to Job? Uh, I don't know if you kept a finger there. Go to Job chapter 31. Job chapter 31. Because here's, here's, I'm, I'm approaching the end now, but, you know, integrity requires examination. You know, think of the construction job. You know, they finish a, a phase of construction, then comes the site supervisor or the inspector, and they're checking the integrity of the work. And so they examine. They examine what's been done. But you know what? Examination is not a time, you know, is, is often an uncomfortable time, okay? Because you're identifying where the failures are. You're identifying where the faults are. It's not, people aren't really comfortable because you're being tested. You're being prodded, okay? And so if you want to be a church of integrity, we also need to learn to examine ourselves and put our hand up if we're doing something wrong. Just say, yeah, you know what? We messed up. We stuffed up, you know? You know, we failed in this area. Just put your hand up and just admit it, okay? And then we can fix it and be people of integrity. But Job chapter 31, verse 1. Job chapter 31, verse 1. This is Job speaking. He says, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? For what portion of God is there from above? 
And what inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is not destruction to the wicked and a strange punishment to the workers of iniquity? Doth not he see my ways and count all my steps? If I have walked with vanity, or if my foot have hasted, hasted to deceit, let me be weighed in an even balance, that God may know my integrity. You know, these questions that Job is asking, they're rhetorical questions. Okay? He knows that he's been walking in the spirit and not walking in the flesh. He says all these things. Have I been looking at a maid? You know, no, I've made a covenant in my eyes. I'm not looking at anyone, any other woman except my own wife. You know, I've, I've not walked with the wicked. You know, I've not, I've not uh, walked in vanity. You know, these are, these are questions. He's looking at himself. He's examining himself. You know, have I been doing wickedly? No, he says, I'm a man of integrity. You know, I, I, I need uh, these, what does it say there? An even balance. God, come and balance my life. Come and check, you know, the, the weight of my integrity. Okay? You know, he, he was willing to be examined by God. And sometimes that's uncomfortable. Okay? How do we examine ourselves? By examining ourselves in the Word of God. How well do we fare? Are we walking with integrity? Are we people of integrity? And that's really what I want to be focusing on in 2019. Okay? And I might make you a bit uncomfortable. We're going to be preaching on sins. We're going to be preaching on areas of our life that we're lacking in, in our spiritual walk. Okay? But it's to fix it. Okay? To make us better. And I'm not a perfect man. I mean, some of these sermons are going to be applicable to me. They always are. Okay? Whatever I preach comes from the Word of God. And I still, even as the pastor, I have to decide, hey, I'm going to make these changes in my life or whatever. Okay? We need to be people of integrity like Job and say, hey, yeah, God, please weigh me in an even balance. That even balance is in the Word of God. It's in the Bible. Okay? That's how we're going to know whether we're righteous or not. Okay? And look, the only part of you that has any integrity, the only part of you is that new man, okay, is the, is the spirit. You know, when you're born of the spirit, that, that's what has integrity. The flesh, the old man, the carnal mind, no integrity, okay, there's no integrity. So how do we make sure that we're, in, we're walking in, in integrity? We make sure we're walking in the spirit. We've got to make sure that we're not walking after the flesh. And still, I know, in 2019, you're going to be walking in the flesh, I know that. But we need to reduce that and walk more in the spirit. That's how we're going to be tested, okay? We need to walk more in the spirit than we were walking in the flesh in 2018, okay? We need to change that ratio, you know? And, uh, you know, and that's why I think I mentioned on Wednesday that I have a desire to go through and preach on the fruits of the spirit, you know? Because the only way you can have the fruits of the spirit in you is if you're walking in the spirit. That's the only way. If you're walking in the flesh... Those fruits will never come out. Okay, those fruits are going to, to determine if you in your own personal life are someone of integrity. Okay, so that, that's going to be an important part. Early in the new year, I'll be preaching on the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, but uh, look at Job tw chapter 27. Look at Job chapter 27. Job chapter 27 verse 1. It says, Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, As God liveth, who have taken away my judgment, and the Almighty who have vexed my soul, all the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. So there in verse number 3, it says, Look, all the while my breath is in me. It says, you know, while I'm alive, is essentially what he's saying. Well, the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. While I'm living, he says, My lips shall not speak wickedness nor my tongue utter deceit. God forbid that I should justify you. It says, till I die, I will not remove my integrity from me. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I live. That's what I love about Job. He says, doesn't matter about my tribulations. Doesn't matter when I lose everything and I lose my health. And I'm close to dead. No. All the days of my life, says Job, I'm going to have my integrity before God. That's what I want for our church. Okay? And ourselves as individuals. 
that we would truly say with Job, hey, all the days of our life, as long as there's breath in me, I'm going to be someone of integrity. I'm going to walk in integrity. I'm going to be, uh, have that clear conscience before God in my dealings. That's what I want for our church all the days of our lives. Until the Lord comes back, I would love for New Life Baptist Church to be a church of integrity. Say so how? How do we do that? Just I'll give you some practical points here right now. Number one, our preaching needs to be preaching with integrity. Okay? When we preach behind this pulpit, we want to ensure that our doctrine that is being taught is built upon clear scripture. You know, scripture that emphatically teaches that truth. You know? Let, let's just look. Whatever's clear in the Bible, we teach that. Okay? And if you have your opinions, that's fine. But mention those are your opinions. And your opinions might be right. Okay? But make sure people know the difference between your opinions and what the Word of God emphatically says. That's how we're going to be sound in doctrine. Okay? Number two, we've, been, we've preaching. Not only do we preach behind the pulpit, but we preach door to door. Okay? And we need to tighten up our soul winning techniques a little bit. Okay? So, by the way, I've, uh, our, um, do you guys remember the soul winning conference that was had earlier in the year? Well, that DVD is on its way. So I'm going to choose some of the best portions of that DVD and we'll watch it together as a church one day. Okay? But so I'll make sure that everybody gets a copy of that as well. But we can improve in our soul winning. You know, we can improve in our techniques. We can be a little bit more consistent with how we do things. And then the last, I don't want to turn us into robots where you're just following the script and you're exactly the same. And, and if you're not exactly the same, we're going to call you out. And, you know, no, 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 no. You know, but there, there are areas of our life that we can improve. Hey, we can make our soul winning more sound. Hey, we, can, we, can, we need to make sure that our soul winning is with integrity. Okay? And what else? When we preach, sometimes when we preach, we expose false teaching. Or we expose false teachers, false prophets. That's fine. You know, to make accusations, that's all good. But let's make sure when we do that, we do it with integrity. We do it in truth. Okay? If there's a, a false preacher to expose, go for it. All right? But make sure that you correctly... Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? can't remember what I'm saying right now, but... Don't exaggerate, okay? Oh, yeah, correctly represent what they're saying. You know, take down what they're saying. Take down the false teaching. It's all good. But don't over-exaggerate, okay? Don't misrepresent. Don't lie about them. You say, well, who cares? They're a false prophet. I'll tell you why it cares, because then you're not doing it with integrity, okay? And when, when, when you expose false teachers and you, do, and you lie about it and you misrepresent, People are going to notice that, okay? And, and it's going, what's going to happen, instead of people looking at, at the falsehoods of that teacher, they're going to look at how you misrepresented them and think of you as the false accuser, okay? Integrity is important when we expose the false prophets and the false teachings. Integrity with our Bible reading. You know, we, you know people say, you know, what kind of Christian are you? What kind of... We're a Bible-believing Christian. That's good. But when's the last time you read your Bible? Has it been several days, maybe several weeks? I mean, is that a person of integrity? You say, I'm a Bible-believing Christian, but you haven't picked up your Bible in days. You know, there's dust gathering on your Bible. Hey, that's not integrity, okay? No, we need to make sure that we're Bible-believing Christians and that we read our Bibles. We know what the Word of God says, all right? And look, New Year's resolution, and I'll say this every year, if you've not read your Bible cover to cover yet, 2019, guys, this is the year that you're going to read through your Bible, okay? Be someone of integrity. Read through your Bible cover to cover in 2019. And I've, I've put together a, uh, a Bible reading plan. I forgot to bring it. I still need to print it out, actually. Um, I did put one... Well, like a plan that I've put together, okay? Where basically you've got an AM session and a PM session, okay? That you can read maybe in the morning, seven minutes in the morning or eight minutes in the morning, 
seven minutes at night before you go to bed. Hey, anyone can do that. Okay, you might find, it, might find it hard to find 15 minutes, you know, of the day, but you can find seven minutes in the morning. You can find seven minutes at night, okay? So if you haven't read your Bible cover to cover, then I'll, I'll, send, that, I'll, I'll send it to everybody. I don't need to know who you are. I'll send it to everyone. If you want to use it, use it. You know, I'm not saying to use it. If you're already doing it or you're reading through the Bible more than once a year, don't worry about it, okay? But if you haven't done it, please be someone of integrity, a Bible-believing Christian of integrity, and read through your Bible at least once every year, okay? We need to be a church with integrity. We need to be a church of integrity with our finances. I can't tell you guys through my whole life, okay? I've, every time I've seen churches go through problems, internal turmoil, so many times it's about the finances, okay? And it's because of a lack of communication, a lack of transparency, okay? Or in some very wicked cases, you've got leadership taking money, stealing money for themselves or whatever, okay? It's important, and, and you know, you guys never really ask me and never question me, I don't care. I, I want to tell you what we're doing in the finances. You know, the men in the church, you guys know, I, I tell you every month when we pay the lease of this building, you know, just so you know where the money's going and that things are being taken care of, you know. And uh, probably in the next week or two, I'm going to give you guys an update on the finances anyway for the whole church. So, uh, you know, we need to make sure that we're good stewards with what God has given us. You know, take care of what God has given us. You know, the finances are not mine. The finances are the Lord's. The finances are the church for us to make sure the work of God continues here on the Sunshine Coast. All right? Um, and I said integrity with what God has given us. Not only the finances, but the Lord, beyond my expectation, has given us this building. Okay? I, I was never really asking for a building for ourselves, right? I was just looking for a place that we can meet on Sundays. And God has come and given this building to us, guys. Let's, let's have integrity with what God has given us. Do your part to maintain this building, okay? You know, if, if, if you're walking along and you see rubbish on the floor, just pick it up, chuck it in the bin, okay? Don't, be, don't have this mindset, well, you know, that wasn't my rubbish, you know, or, yeah, I, I know whose kids did that. Hey, look, if you're walking along, just take care of it, put it in the bin, whatever. If there's something in the building that needs to be fixed up, you know, I went to the toilet, that door's creaky. Yeah, get some WD-40 or whatever and, and you know, Put some oil on the hinges them, you know, so, so it opens nice and smoothly. Whatever. Whatever there is, look, let's take care of what God has given us. You don't need to check everything with me. If there's something that's obvious that needs to be done, just do it, you know. Take care. And look, what you bring into this building, please take with you. You know, if you bring food or whatever, please make sure you throw it in the bins or take it back with you. Because the ants over here get crazy. They smell a bit of sugar or whatever, and, and, and then this, ants is, this place is infested with ants, right? So, you know, please be careful. Take care of this building that God has given us. If you see rubbish, please pick it up. If we all do a little part, then, you know, nobody has to um, go out of the way and do a lot of work in this building. The last thing I wanted to say is let's have integrity in our families. Integrity in our families. You know, we, we've gone through this series on the family. You know, fathers, husbands. Take ownership for your family. Be the head of your house. Be the leader. Give yourself sacrificially to your wife and to your family. And wives, be submissive to your husbands. You know, give them the respect. Give them the authority that God has already given them. Okay, be subject to that man. You know, we're, we're losing the family structure in this world. Okay, and, and my, an old pastor of mine, he always said it, and, and I love it. You know, a church can only be as strong as the families that are in it, okay? You know, if, if your family is stressed and, 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 and strained and there's problems in your marriages, that's going to reflect in this church, okay? We want to be a strong church. We want to be a church of integrity. Then your family needs to be strong. Your family needs to be one of integrity, okay? Because you are the church. You know, the church is not Kevin Sepulveda. The church is everybody here, okay? We're all fellow laborers with the Lord in this building. So that's what I wanted to cover today, guys. 2018 has been awesome. I love it. You know, we've done a lot of great works. You know, we've, we've established on strong foundations. God has come through and given us many wonderful blessings. Praise God, you know. And we've not gone through any major tribulations or anything like that. Praise God. 
you know, but they might come, you know, and when they do come, and they will come, you know, I want to make sure that we're standing strong, that we're a church of integrity, okay, that we're a church that's genuine, that's standing strong for the word of God, and it doesn't matter if we stay poor, good, I'd rather be poor, but have our integrity, okay, let's pray.